Hi, welcome to Bush History. I'm David Bush. Today I'm going to be interviewing my good friend Norman Smith. He's Professor Norman Smith here at Eckerd College and affectionately known as Norm. The purpose of this video is for Norm to share his ideas on life and education. He's seen a lot, he's done a lot, and we want to kind of immortalize Norm. So uh, let's go, let's do a little background here. Norm is the Associate Dean of Students here at Eckerd College and he has been in that role for 10 years. He has been at Eckerd College for 15 years in various roles. He has been involved in ASPEC, which is our Society for Senior Professionals here at Eckerd College. In previous incarnations, Norm has been a CEO of an organization called Catalytica and they do catalysts for chemical reactions and Norm can explain more about that. Norm has a PhD in chemical engineering. He is a member of the bar in several states, and I do mean the law bar, although Norm might spend time other places as well. In either case, in his long and varied career, Norm has done a lot, including his most famous accomplishment as far as I'm concerned, in that he put together the chemical formula for Mr. Clean. And I think also in a younger incarnation, Norm was probably the model for Mr. Clean. Nevertheless, Norm is teaching at Eckerd College right now and he is impressing students on a daily basis. So that is really where we, where we are going to begin. Norm, how did you end up at Eckerd after all of the other things that you have done in your life? I guess I'm tempted to say that every classroom needs a Norm. Okay. That's what we absolutely need. Um, I have to say, the Mr. Clean example is an interesting example because, yeah, I did develop the formula, but that doesn't mean there's a truck that comes outside my home every day, dumps off some cash. It means they let me go to work the next day. I was hired to invent, and so I invented. Uh, but I think that's, there's a, a story in that because why did I invent the Mr. Clean? Because I'm curious. And curiosity is something that's very worthwhile to have in terms of what are we trying to make our students do? What, what's important? What's in life? And the classes I teach tend to be about life, not let's learn this, let's learn that, tend to be about life. And curiosity is an important thing. Uh, curiosity had led me to work with liquids in products other than Mr. Clean. Uh, one day a problem appeared with Procter & Gamble, a competitor came out they, with a new liquid product, they didn't have anything. They came in and a formulation I would have developed for another product turned out to be fine, didn't suds, cleaned a lot and so forth. So that was a, here is something that Curiosity had led me into that formulation. Now, the other point being is that I've invented a lot of other things too. I mean, I have a really great dishwashing liquid. It foams, it cleans grease and so forth, and turns your hands bright red and swell twice the size in five seconds. Which says, okay, so we try different things and see what happens. Some work and some don't work. Don't worry about it. If it doesn't work, go on and do it. If it now, works, go with it. Is that a lifelong philosophy you've had? Absolutely. It's a, it's a strong philosophy, and it's one that's maybe not so easy to think about in the educational setting, because in educational ses setting, tends to be more conservative. People don't like to fail. I'm a believer in test markets. Let's try this class, get four people and try it and see if it works. If it works, fine. If it doesn't, who cares? If you don't make the occasional mistake, then you're not pushing far enough outside the box. All right, let, let's back up sure. a little bit. Uh, some biographical information, if you don't mind. Where were you born and things along those lines, and what led you to be a chemist? Born in Detroit, Michigan. Grew up in Michigan, went to the University of Michigan, um, and studied, couldn't quite decide at first. Should I be a musician, should I study music? Or should I study chemistry, which I really liked? Took me a year. And, okay, let's, let's see about that year. Tried it out, tried out the music, tried out the chemistry. Finally decided to graduate with chemistry, chemical engineering. 
Why did I do it? I was sort of curious. Chemistry is fascinating. Put things together, what happens? Does it work? Does it not work? Uh, in chemical engineering, try the different types of strength of materials. Does it work or does it work? Does it break or not? And the music, to some extent, was a little bit more set without the curiosity and the ability to go outside the box. If you're playing bassoon, you can't cheat some quite as much go outside the box as in the chemistry business. Were you a curious child? It's an interesting phraseology. Uh, yeah. <laughs> sure, I'll go with that. What kinds of things make you curious or made you curious? How did this happen? Why is it like that? Why does it look like that? What's that color change we see? All those things are curious. Um, how come people put blue dye in their laundry? That's an interesting thought. They do. Not so much nowadays, but they used to. And so that was the truth. Why does our milkman drive a cart with a horse, horse-drawn cart? Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Why does he do that? All these things are very, the, if you're not curious, are you alive? I think that's a real question. Do you think there's a difference between curious people who act on their curiosity and people who just sit around and think? I don't know the answer to that very well, because mm -hmm. I'm unlikely to just sit around and think. As often as possible, I will try. And as we said in the beginning, hmm. Try this, see if it works. Does it work or does it not work? You're wearing a nice blue shirt. So are you. <laughs> <laughs> I invented a outstanding laundry detergent that could turn your shirt into a mass of non-woven fibers in 10 washings. Now that's another thing that's pretty hard to figure out what to do. But wasn't it fun? And what was I doing? I was going up and down the periodic table checking differences. So there was a structure in what I was doing. But I was curious, suppose we replace this with that, what happens? Happens with people, happens in the educational system, happens in chemistry, perhaps happens in music. Now, Norm and I have been together here at uh, Eckery College for about three years now, and we developed a, a quick friendship, if you like. We share a lot of things, and one of the things that we talk about is opportunity and how as you go through life different things present themselves so if we could hit that vein for a second if you could trace your career um, as comfortably as you want from becoming a chemical engineer to ending up here because there are a lot of exits on that highway along the way and you chose certain ones to end up here and the way of putting it as a highway is absolutely correct because that's that's what life is that's what education is it's a journey. It's not, I have to get this destination now and go to it. No, it's a journey. So graduating chemistry, chemical engineering, I wanted to go into uh, graduate school, had a graduate fellowship in chemistry, uh, had a professor, had a project. It's a long story, but uh, eventually ended up that uh, I went into industry instead. My roommate who wanted to go into industry went into academia. I ended up at Procter & Gamble. He ended up as the head of the chemistry department at the University of Minnesota. So had we said, I want to go there, we might not have done it. Had we said, here's the journey. Let's try this, let's try this road. Let's try it and see. Um, so graduated. Uh, then I said, gee, I need a hobby. Let's go to law school. Well, my father had always wanted me to go to law school. Therefore, I wouldn't go to law school. That's why I went and studied chemistry. Uh, went to law school at night while I was working with Proctor. Uh, I'm still a patent lawyer, and that's sort of a fun thing to do. Doesn't, it sounds like a weird hobby, but what is law? Well, to some extent, law is putting together a jigsaw puzzle, taking the pieces, putting them together, come up with the result you would like or think you would want, and it's working with people. Isn't that what education is? Looking way down the field of education, that's working with people. Um, this worked out for a while until my boss came in one day and said, would you like to go to work in Germany? I said, yes. He said, think about it. I said, I have. Another lesson, don't overthink. Be opportunistic and go for it. And if it works, 
terrific. If it doesn't work, try something else. So I went to Germany, uh, sort of got confused a little bit in the uh, London airport because... Would that have been Heathrow? That was Heathrow Airport. Easy place S to get confused. Yeah, very easy. And stumbled through the place and said, you know, Smith, you're out of your mind. You're going to Germany. You don't speak German. You don't even understand what people are saying here. And I know the reason for that now, but at that point it was, what in the world are you doing? Ended up in Germany at the coldest winter they have had in 50 years. Uh, worked in a, we, we actually developed a laboratory in the bombed out uh, pilot plant of an old leather factory. And uh, had our meals in the German army canteen which the German army had a uh, canteen across the road, not to be recommended, but it worked. And so went there, spent a few years in Germany, uh, spent a few years in Brussels, a few years in the UK, met my wife there, she's Italian. Worked out very well. Then it was, do you want to stay in Europe or do you want to go back? By this time, we, I had a, uh, a son. I figured it was about time for him to go back to the States, go to the States. And we went back and, interestingly, Parking Club, which I loved as a company, wasn't quite as good as I expected when I got back. It had grown too much, and it was too overly complicated with the infrastructure. Whole uh, departments working on things, which I thought were maybe not too important. So an opportunity came along, went to a company called Stepan up in Chicago, which dealt with polymers and surfactants uh, as vice president of product development. Uh, great time, spent a lot of time, lived in Chicago. And what time period are we talking about? This would be the uh, mid-70s to mid-80s. Okay. Uh, then got an, had an opportunity to go work for BF Goodrich as vice president of one of their divisions. Uh, that was pretty interesting. What's a chemist doing running a division of B.F. Goodrich? Uh, well, because B.F. Goodrich made chemicals. And chemicals are important, but now you have to deliver the infrastructure of people along with that. So you're ending up with, here's what you learned in chemistry. What have you learned about people? Well, one thing was the law degree helped because that was people. The other was uh, somehow I attended some sort of seminar and ended up signing up for a master's degree in adult education. So if I can interrupt for a second, from what I'm hearing, there are a series of events that occur. Yep. And along this highway of events, there are opportunities that some were planned and some were completely serendipity. Exactly. They came out of nowhere. Exactly. exactly. And, and the, the, the moral here is keep your eyes and ears open. Always listen. Uh, the one thing I probably don't do is reject an idea out of hand in anything. So keep keep your keep your mind open because it might be a good opportunity. It might be a bad opportunity. What is life? Life is to have fun. I tell the students all the time, have fun. Every job I've had has been fun. Not every day. Some have been dreadful. Uh, usually the ones that were dreadful were because what I was doing was putting a yardstick of success on my terms rather than someone else's terms, higher. Therefore, it was tougher to meet. So serendipity is important, and don't close your mind to something that may come across. The Stepan, sorry, the B.F. Goodrich was important. They, they wanted to hire me when I was in Chicago and I eventually turned them down. Three years later, they came and said, we still haven't hired anybody because we wanted someone like you. Would you be interested? At that point, I did. Now, how about, as you're going through this, the element of mistakes, errors, and regrets comes along someplace. Are mistakes important? Sure. Why? Because if you don't make it, you're not going far enough. And if you're not going far enough, you're not doing what you should be doing. And this holds true for, for me personally. It holds true for anyone that works with me or for me, because 
as a manager, which I was becoming more and more of a manager and less of a technologist, you people need to be allowed to make a mistake but not a terminal one, not one that's going to hurt them. They need to learn from the, we all learn from mistakes. So try a mistake, try something. If you make a mistake, no big deal. Do you have a story of a mistake that allowed you to then prosper? Sure. Um, the one mistake that, that I made uh, was in Germany. Where I had developed a, a job of trying to make a non-phosphate detergent for the environment. My boss wanted me to make a certain level. I said, no, I'm not going to do it. It'll have to be zero. Zero phosphate, you're talking Zero phosphate. Okay. That was a dreadful time in my life. Hard to get there. Uh, it didn't do very well at, at processing. It was hard to make, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, we finally did it. And so the horrible time I had in the middle of it was sort of wiped away by the fact that, okay, it was successful. And I'd rather make a goal here and maybe miss it a little bit than go here and make it. And if I'm not allowed to make a mistake, and allowed is a... Um, an interesting term in the industry because sort of allowed, but be careful. Don't make too big of a mistake. Don't make too big of a mistake. Don't blow up the plant. So now, we're going through this. How'd you end up here? Long story? You don't mind long Give the stories? story you want. It needs to be a long story because what's important, and you'll probably hear me say this before, many times, uh, life is a journey. What you do in life is like an onion, and if you don't build up the onion, you can't peel it down at some point and get to where you want to go. So how did you get here? Well, I was in, this was in BF Goodrich, and I was getting ready to retire, and I read the Wall Street Journal. And the Wall Street Journal said, if you ever want to retire, retired to either North Carolina or this little college in Florida called Ecker College. Serendipity comes in because along the line, for some reason, I had also uh, taken it past the Florida bar. It was a New York bar, but who wants to go to New York? So I did this with the Florida Maybe bar. somebody watching this wants yeah. to go to New York. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I look at you. Oh, okay. Uh, and I've been a member of the New York bar for about 20 years by now. Uh, so I was, uh, I was admitted to the bar, came down here, it was a lot of fun. Made a mistake. And I answered the telephone one day. Who's on the line? A headhunter who says, do you know anyone who would like to be president of a company in California? I said, well, not offhand, but give me a call in two days and I'll see if I have a list. So I worked on a list, they called, and they said, well, you know, we really want you. I said, you don't want anybody old like me. They said, we really want you. Long story short, sort of, um, I said, eventually, oh, it's going to be a free trip to California. So went out to California. It was pretty interesting. I'd never been president of a company before. And this was a, a startup company in Silicon Valley, Catalytica. And that was pretty interesting. Unfortunately, we had moved our furniture and my wife and the cat down to Florida. So I had to move the furniture, the wife and the cat, maybe in that order, out to California. Uh, my wife learned that you don't put bags of the cats through the x-ray machine. It scares the people watching the cat skeleton. Uh, but we made it. The cat was happy. The cat lived another X number of years. And we were pretty happy. We lived in Palo Alto. Uh, it was an exciting job. Uh, it was sort of a, how do you plan? See, planning is important. How do you plan for a company to be successful 20 years in the future? Because it was advanced technology. And spent a few years doing that. We, we had a lot of interesting stuff. And finally came back to Eka College 
Move the furniture cat back, and my wife also. In that order? In that order, yep. Okay. Getting priorities straight. Priority. Priori Prioritization is important in anything you do. I went with, uh, uh, I was attending one of the classes and got a phone call so the president would like to talk to you. And he said, I'd like you to be uh, head of our uh, Academy of Senior Professionals. I said, thank you, that's not my career path. He said, let's talk. So a couple hours later, I somehow had agreed to work half time, uh, which was 68 hours a week, and for a short period of time. And that's how I got into it, because at the same time, I began picking up some classes to teach, mainly based on uh, self-knowledge or self-discovery, and what do you need to be successful after college? Uh, so after four years, I said, thank you very much. I finished with that, uh, then sort of wandered into this job of uh, social dean of students, and have been teaching course ever since, up to maybe six, six a year type of thing. That's how I got into the teaching business. What do I teach? Why do I teach? I was going to ask those questions, but okay. Well, you got, I got ahead of you here. Go right ahead. It's a blue shirt. <laughs> You're having way too much fun with this. <laughs> <laughs> well, isn't life fun? Yes, it is. Isn't school fun? Isn't everything fun? And if it's not fun, go do something else. There's lots of, we could go out and stand in the rain. That's something that different That could be fun. fun. Yes. That, that could be fun. So we need to do that. We need to think about what is fun. And it's those who don't think about it that get in trouble. Because then it doesn't become fun. I can hardly wait to retire. I can hardly wait for Friday City. What's retiring? If you're doing something that's fun, there's no such word as retire. So you, you do that. So now you've been teaching at Eckerd for 10 years. Right. Correct? And um, I'm a high school teacher. You're a college professor. We share ideas about education in common. We have this discussion about um, skills, and content and things like that with students. How would you assess the average college student you come across in terms of their skill set in preparation for college and success in life? Tempting to answer yes, because it's not it's, a yes no question. Yeah, I know. So it's it's apples and oranges. The skill set is very different from what it used to be. Mm -hmm. The skill set today is based on extremely fast pickup of knowledge. Uh, someone today taught me, all I had to do was push something on my computer and it translates from Italian to English. That was a pretty slick trick. Yeah, see, and I, I didn't realize that. You can do that now, but you, you never realized you couldn't do that before. What it does is say, okay, students, you must be prepared to be fast. You need to be prepared to be your eyes and ears open so that, in fact, you're up to date on the technology. The technology is causing all sorts of discontinuous innovations to come along. Be aware of what's happening. Is it impacting on how they're learning? It impacts absolutely on how they're learning because we used to have to say, well, let's go somewhere and have a meeting and do something. Now you flip the switch and Skype and turn it on and you're doing all these things together. But the skill sets are different because you're able to do this, you're able to do it quickly, but you need to be careful that you're not missing completely the human element, the socialization, the group building, the value of diversity, all of these things which are really important but can be missed if you're not careful. How about the ways we teach today? Are we teaching in line with the way students are learning? Or are we still teaching it an old-fashioned or outmoded uh, methodology compared to the way they're able to pick up information now? I don't quite know the answer to that. All I know is that from my own standpoint, I have a feeling that we're the students today are being taught, probably from the elementary school on, in a way which is the way we can handle it and can work it better than, here's, here's what you need to learn, go learn. Now, Montessori is a little bit the other way, but a, a standard grade school, elementary school, 
is here's what I'm going to do today. Here's what I'm going to do. Now we're going to take a standardized test. And to some, in some cases, we may be teaching to pass the test rather than acquire the knowledge. So I think it's something that it's, we need to be careful that we aren't going too far overboard. Now go a step further, we have the discussion about content, subject area content versus skills. Skills within the subject area, skills to be a successful college student and life skills. What do you think is more important and why? The answer to this is the content skills are going to get you in the door after graduation. They get you into a company. They get you into a university. They get you into wherever you want to go. But they won't keep you there. So you need other skills to build on that in order to be successful. So your content skills say you're going to be, go in this and you're going to go in this company, you're going to be in this college. Now what do you do? Well, now you need socialization skills. You need to be able to communicate. You need to be able to write. You need to be able to present. So all of these things are, are so important. You can't say, okay, um, I've studied nuclear biology for X number of years, and therefore, here I am. Well, here you are, but the skills required for that are going to be changing every few months because the world is moving quickly. Does that answer the question? It does answer the question. Now, one of the things that I've always found interesting here um, is students line up to meet Norm. Norm has a, an office just off to my right, and on any given day, there will be students lining up to speak to Norm, and Norm spends a lot of time with a student when a student makes an appointment with him, and when they drop in, he tries to spend a lot of time. It doesn't always work out that way because scheduling is an issue. So my question is, why do you think, um, you know, you're older in this profession right now, and uh, there's always this, uh, this discussion of relevance and can we still connect and things like that. Why do you think students want to talk to you? The obvious answer is I'm a nice guy. Okay, let's get past the obvious. Yeah. <laughs> I'll give you that. Getting past the obvious. Yes. It's because they feel I have something to offer them. Which is exactly why I want to be on this continuum, is that I, I've gone through experiences, I've had experiences. How can I translate that for them? And so, can I help them? And the answer is sometimes, more often than not. I'm also non-judgmental. I don't think there's anything you're going to tell me that I haven't heard before. And I don't care. It's, not, it's, it's all in this. And can I help them do something? The answer to that is a harder thing to find out, except that every year I get a few letters saying, you know, when I took your course, I thought it was the worst course I ever was going to take. I didn't understand it. I, did, I knew I wasn't going to learn anything, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now I've been out in the real world for X number of years, and it's the best course I had in college because it taught me to be successful in life. And that's, what it, that's really what it's all about. They feel that I can help them be successful in life or help them with uh, what they're doing in school. Tell me about your major. Well, is why are you in, in that? You don't seem very interested. What do you really like? Well, let me give you, um, based on my observations, let me give you a scenario. A student walks into your office, it's a junior, been here a few years, uh, has had three or four different majors, can't quite figure out what, let's use a she, what she wants to do. She's afraid to tell her parents that she's in college at this time, that hasn't figured out what she's doing. She's doing reasonably well but not up to her standards of success. She comes to you and she says, I'm confused, I don't know what to do with myself, and I have heard these conversations. What do you say to her? What do you like? What really turns you on? What are your interests? We sometimes add to that a psychological instrument that helps determine what sort of things a person would like. Had a young lady today that wasn't sure. Everything in the instrument said, you're interested in helping people, in science, 
in medicine, maybe not hard medicine, but uh, things like x-ray technician, things like that. Uh, it gives us something to work with. Now, how do we fit that in? Or it may be that student comes in and I really don't know what I, what I want to do. We have to probe. And you're, you're, the way you set up the question was, they've had several different things to do, several different majors and so forth. Probing that, and is there a thread running through this that lets you say, aha, this is what we've done in each one of these things, each time we've tried it. And let's work on that. Maybe it's socializing with people. Maybe it's curiosity, whatever. And that helps start the conversation. Once you've started the conversation, to be honest, it's fairly easy of trying to find out what the person wants. And th there are ways to check. There are ways that I check myself. Uh, not very long ago, I finished the course. Uh, I think almost the last day, an ex-student came by and said, you know, I really liked your course. I'd like to talk to your class about why it's a good class and what they're going to learn. So he came in, did, and it worked out. It was just absolutely super. That's the kind of input that is good for the students to know. It's good for me to know. Because that lets me check myself. Am I just spouting stuff, or is it useful? If you were asked, because I'm going to, if you were to ask what skill or what is necessary for a young person to master to be successful in society now, what would be the one thing you would suggest that they work on or master? Working with people. Everything has to do with people. Uh, we don't have many job openings for hermits. And so working with people is so important. That involves communication. That involves understanding people. It, it involves knowing the value of diversity so you can set up the proper teams. Working with people is in everything we do. Now, technology allows people to be more and more isolated to perform basic tasks. Yes, they might be speaking to people figuratively in other parts of the world and communicating. That's not the same as human communication and interpersonal communication. So what you're saying almost flies in the face of the way technology is evolving with people's skills and with people's learning styles. Online learning, for example, is one example of that. Um, Skype communication. So how would you combat that? I don't know that you combat it or you live with it. Because it, it, in some cases, you have to use the online because there's not enough people around in the in a particular area. So online is important. You don't throw it away. You say, how can I use the online Skypes, et cetera, et cetera, to make the job easier for you, the student? OK, now connecting to that, I'm going to assume throughout your career there are certain students who stick out in terms of success and then the poignant ones who stick out because it didn't go the way it was supposed to go. Can you, without using names, share a positive and a negative story about two students? A positive story is, is a student that uh, went off to Africa and got involved with a group I don't recall the country now, um, and help set up an orphanage. In this foreign country. And when she was around here, came back for two years to talk to my class with a video of what she was accomplishing in Africa. Everybody in the room had tears in their eyes. How long ago was this? About three years. Not very long ago. Um, and I heard from her just recently. So that is not only, here's what you did, here's what you did, but you know how to transfer that information to other people to really hit them in the heart. A negative story, I, I, I'm not sure I have a, a negative story to tell you. I'm sure there are out there. That how about like a disappointment? Can you do that one? If you can't, that's fine. Not offhand, actually, uh, because the students I work closely with, they're hard to disappoint you. They, they work hard, and they work at what they're doing, and I'm not sure it's a real disappointment. There are some that I wished had 
gone on to graduate work because they were really good. There are some students who went on to graduate work, but I thought they'd be far better as a teacher. But that's not a disappointment. That's just different, uh, as you put it, uh, exit the road. Okay, and let's, let's hit that road metaphor again. One of the things I find when I work with students here is there's a, a lack of patience. You and I, we both have a little uh, snow on the roof. You have a little more than I do. Um, know that things take time to evolve. And sometimes the best thing you can do is be patient and not rush the situation. Uh, example is someone starts in a job and starts at an entry level position and immediately wants to be three steps higher, but they haven't proven themselves yet so they don't get that opportunity. And they get frustrated and they, they leave. How, how can we encourage young people to be patient and let the opportunities evolve? Maybe we train them or teach them in, in ways that are maybe a little different from what we do now to show the value of patience. There's some, there some studies showing the value of patience uh, with young children. Uh, and I, th I think that teaching has a responsibility to try to follow through on that because Again, if that, that would be a real sad story from my standpoint if because of patient, patience or lack thereof, a student didn't perform what they could do. So, but it's beginning to ferment uh, down in the uh, pre-elementary uh, school how in the world we can teach patience. Well, there's an immediacy. There's an immediacy to information now that didn't occur when you and I were growing up. You can find out anything by typing on a keyboard. Whereas we were growing up, you had to go someplace, possibly ask someone, do some research, and that all took time, and that fostered patience. Now, you can get the answer to most questions you know, pretty much immediately. And you can buy things with a click of a mouse, and you can order a pizza on a phone. These are all things that, that occur very quickly. Do you think that there is a virtue to teaching this weight? When I, as an example, when I was a boy, my father would always tell me that things were always better in the morning. If I was troubled the night before, whatever the reason, whatever the situation was, things will be better in the morning. And of course, I struggled all night long with that. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if things were really better in the morning, but that was what he said. What do you think about trying to teach patients or somehow finding a way to foster it? I think that's important. How would you do it, though? I, w I would think that, that you could arrange, well, number one, you convince the students to go out, take jobs, internships, where, trust me, it will happen. They will learn and have incidents of where patience was there or it wasn't there in, in real life. What happened in real life in this three month internship or volunteer service you had. Do you have an element or something happened in your life that because you were patient actually turned out better than maybe you would have anticipated? I think a lot of times, uh, I have a much more fun example of what my, when I Go wasn't for it. patient, it still worked out. Mm -hmm. It's called getting lucky. Uh, or getting lucky, one or the other. Uh, but, yeah, uh, the young lady in my life. It took us three years before I got to, two and a half years before I got to meet her father. It took a lot of patience. But man, it was worth it. Yes, I, I know her well. It was definitely worth it. Now, how about you and your future? What are your, uh, what are your hopes, professionally, personally, as you look towards your future? To get up the next morning and see the grass on the green side, not the brown side. I anticipate that. Is one of those, answer. yes, exactly. A broader. And continue to work with younger people as long as what I am working with them is meaningful to them. In other words, as long as what I am trying to teach in the class or elsewhere is meaningful, uh, that they can pick it up. And, and work with it. If it isn't meaningful and I'm not needed, then don't do it. Okay, now I've got a curve for you. 
You've been invited, I'm going to give you another scenario. You've been invited to speak to um, a group of college seniors, and the topic is yours to choose. What will you talk to them about? Discontinuous innovation. Explain that, please. That is, keep your mind open for something that might work or do something differently. Or reinforce what it, sh it should be doing now. But we'll continue to move you, move you onward into keeping yourself up to date or modernized uh, and keeping to learn, keep lifelong learning. If it's fun, you can learn all your life. Why am I in this business? I'm having fun. Does learning have to be fun? Sure. Learning has to be fun. Okay. Learning can be done if it isn't fun, but it's not very interesting. Tell us or tell me something that would surprise someone watching this about you. Sure, my early dreams as a kid. When I was a young child, I had real dreams. And we always talk about follow your, fr your childhood dreams. You know what my childhood dream was? I wanted to be a milk man. Why did I want to be a milk man? I could have all the milk I wanted to drink, I thought. And I come from an age when the milk was delivered in a horse-drawn You wanted to drive carriage. the horse-drawn carriage? I wanted to drive that horse-drawn carriage. That's and that was my dream. For a while, and then I changed that for a while. All right, and you don't want to tell us about being a soccer referee? I don't want to tell you about being a soccer referee. That, that took too much wear and tear, and my hip is telling me that it wasn't a good idea. I spent 10 years refereeing soccer all the way from kids to professional soccer in the U.S. And sort of okay. wore me down. We've been talking about half an hour now. Is there anything that you would like me to have asked you or a question you'd like to have asked by a student that you'd like to just answer extemporaneously? Yeah, I think that uh, a question that um, not necessarily you but a student could ask is, and maybe you might too, you know, I'm a senior and I've had a couple reconstructions of my major and my minor, and I'm just not sure what I want to do. What's going to happen when I graduate when I don't know what I'm going to do the rest of my life? Now my answer to that is, I'll use you. Have you always been that particular major? No, you've been different, different types of things. And in doing so, you're picking up knowledge. You're picking up interest. Put them all together and you're, I think, way ahead of a person who stuck to something because their father told them to, or stuck to it because, well, I have to because I'll lose my stipend or what have you. You've learned about yourself, and that's what's important. Tough, but important. All right, now, he, here's your chance before we end this. Is there anything else you would like to say about life, about education, about Norman Smith that's going to be around for a long time? Have fun. And I'll leave it at that. A lot of, lot of things we've talked about. I'll continue on this, of course. Sure. Talked about I know you will. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about taking risks. Take some risks. Come on. Don't be stupid. Take some risks. Keep on learning. Keep on having fun. All of these things add together. Um, don't give up if it doesn't work the first time give up if it hasn't worked the first 99 times. Uh, go for what you enjoy. Don't go for what someone else thinks you might enjoy. All right. I think that's right. probably a, a good way to leave this. So, uh, once again, this is my good friend Norman Smith. I'd like to thank you for your time. Uh, I'm David Bush. This is Bush History. And um, I hope you enjoy this. Good. Thank you. Good.